Well, on behalf of a number of folks who I'm going to name here, thank you so much for coming to this event. Um, we really appreciate you turning out. You know, there's a lot of exciting things going on in the city that you all could choose to come to, so I'm, I'm thrilled to ha be able to host you. Um, for folks who don't know me, I'm Mark Hayes. I'm a senior policy analyst with Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund and Dem Demand Progress Education Fund, which are two organizations um, hosting this event tonight. Um, and I should be remiss if I don't thank um, some of the supporters of this event. Um, one of them is the Media and Democracy Fund, who helped us uh, throw this, uh, this event for you all tonight. Um, so a couple of housekeeping measures. Obviously, there's our bar in the back. There's food available at tables. Um, there'll be food and refreshments after the, uh, the speaking portion. Um, and uh, we're excited to get started. So I'm going to do a few introductions here for our uh, lovely and distinguished guests. Um, I should say a bit about AFR and Demand Progress. Both organizations have been leading efforts to um, engage the cryptoverse with a very critical eye, prioritizing protecting consumer protection, privacy, um, and financial stability, among many other things uh, here in DC and at a national level. Um, and that's why we're thrilled to have our panelists here today, because I think they each represent a different perspective on kind of the other side of the story uh, with crypto. Um, there has been a lot of conversations around crypto here in DC. A lot of it has uh, been influenced by the industry and its considerable reach. Um, I think tonight you're going to hear a slightly different perspective, um, which I know many of you share, but uh, it's really exciting to get, to get to have that conversation in person. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce our, our uh, distinguished guest, Ben McKenzie, um, who, whose book is the focal point of tonight's conversation. Um, Mr. McKenzie is best known for his acting roles in hit television shows like Gotham, The O.C., Southland. Um, and as an actor, Mr. McKenzie's had uh, other notable appearances in other film, television, and, and stage productions. Uh, but his role as a journalist, author, and critic of the crypto industry is what brought him here tonight. Um, his first book alongside journalist Jacob Silverman, Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, and the Golden Age of Fraud. Uh, takes a sort of Alice uh, in Wonderland look at the um, crypto universe um, through Ben's perspective uh, and comes up with a lot of criticisms, a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. And uh, the book has been on the New York Times bestseller list uh, and has been named an authoritative dive into the myths and realities of the crypto universe. Um, also, as Ben will talk about a little bit and talks about in his book, Ben is a UVA grad, um, so he's uh, uh, somewhat local and grew up in Texas. Um, so thank you for being here with us. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, next, I'm really pleased to introduce Professor Derek Hamilton. Uh, Derek is a Henry Cohen Professor in Economics and Urban Policy at the New School. Um, he's also the founding director of the Institute on, uh, on Race and Power and Political Economy at the New School. He's also on uh, AFR's board, um, so really pleased to have his time and expertise here tonight. He's a Tar Heel, but we're not going to hold that against him. <laughs> you There's, beat me to it. <laughs> you're going to cut that 20 different ways here. Um, uh, he's considered one of the nation's foremost public intellectuals, has been quoted in uh, pro profile in the New York Times, Mother Jones. Um, and has been involved in crafting policy proposals that have garnered media attention and inspired um, things like uh, baby bonds, guaranteed income, and a federal job guarantee, all things that really fit the, the profile and priorities of many of the groups here and certainly the groups um, hosting tonight. Um, well, uh, next, we have Tenancing Carmona, um, who is uh, a David M. Rubenstein Fellow at Brookings Metro. And her work has focused on inclusive, equitable solutions for historically disinvested communities. And th that includes topics around racial equity, wealth and inequality, public finance, and civic tech. Uh, and a lot of her work recently is focused on the risks and drawbacks of crypto for black, Latinx, um, and other communities of color, uh, especially those looking to access financial services and build wealth. And prior to Brookings, uh, Ms. Carmona spent time as chief of policy in the Chicago City Clerk's Office and was the director of the Office of New Americans, uh, Chicago's mayor's office. And there, um, you launched a number of uh, different policies, including Chicago's Muni Card, um, all really focused on providing access and availability to different kinds of city services for marginalized communities. So these are your guests, and I'm excited to uh, speak with them tonight. Um, so we're going to start with you, Ben, um, obviously because your book is one of the main reasons we're here. Um, and, you know, I spoke about this being sort of an Alice through the looking glass kind of exposure to crypto. It, 
it, it starts with sort of a Mr. Smith goes to Washington approach where I, I haven't seen any of this. Let's take a look at it and see what happens. Right. Um, but it gets stranger and stranger as you go through it. And stupider and stupider. Yes. <laughs> That's a different movie. As cryptos um, want to do. But you as a character in this story sort of wear different hats as well as an actor, a journalist, and a skeptic, um, and more. And I, I think for folks who, who may not have read the book, um, you know who you are. Um, no, I'd love it's to... It's available for purchase, yes. I'm just saying. Right. We're going to talk about that. That's today. right. Um, I'd love for you to summarize kind of how you began this journey, and then maybe share a key insight you might want to pass on to your former self about that journey, knowing what you know now about crypto. Ooh, that's a good question. I haven't gotten that question. Nice. Uh, okay, so um, how I fell into it was the first part. Uh, boredom. COVID-induced boredom. Uh, it was late 2020, early 2021. Uh, COVID was in its uh, full effect, and showbiz was on ice. Uh, there was no way for me to practice my given pr profession, pretending to be other people. And so I had to be myself, which was quite awkward. Um, I have a degree in economics. I saw the markets going nuts. And I, it, was, it started with just curiosity. What's going on? Um, you know, I, re I remember the markets going down and then back up, the meme stocks, crypto, obviously, NFTs. It was all um, sort of fascinating in terms of just trying to understand what was going on. Um, at the same time, a friend of mine uh, from UVA came to me and said I should buy Bitcoin. Uh, we, m many people in this room have probably had that experience. Um, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately for me, <laughs> I remember that my friend had given me terrible financial advice when I was in my 20s. Uh, he'd encouraged, encouraged me to invest in a, um, it was a company that had supposedly produced synthetic blood. Um, this is not Theranos, this is not a Theranos story. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, some guy at a wedding had assured him that they were gonna make a ton of money and so you know we needed to invest right now. And uh, I was young and dumb, I'd made some money on TV and so I, I threw a little money at it and we promptly lost uh, most of our money. So when Dave, my good friend Dave, came to me in 2021 and said I should buy Bitcoin, I said, I'm not going to, but tell me more. Um, and, and that started me down the rabbit hole. It actually started with words. Um, you know, I'm a storyteller, but words are our tools, and words can be used for a variety of purposes, to entertain, to educate, but also to deceive, and potentially to defraud. And it actually started with the word currency. Um, I think we shouldn't overlook that. Um, you know, words have meaning. <laughs> um, uh, a word without meaning is, is nonsense, literally. And when cryptocurrencies call themselves currencies, they are not currencies, right? They don't do what money does. They're a poor medium of exchange, unit of account, store of value. Um, and they can't work as money for a variety of purposes, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which is the technology itself in terms of proof of work for Bitcoin. It can't scale. Um, but another is that this quote unquote money, um, well, where would it come from if it didn't come from the government? Um, crypto folks don't like to talk about this, but the answer is corporations, right? I mean, who would issue these monies? Um, whether it's Bitcoin miners mining the money, two mining pools control over half of the hash rate of uh, Bitcoin, or all of these other 20,000 cryptocurrencies out there there's always people behind them. You know, code does not fall from the sky. People write code. Well, we tried private money before. It was an invisible failure. So I became obsessed with the topic. Um, and after several months, I came to the realization that either I was crazy, which uh, given the pandemic and, uh, you know, <laughs> my mental health was, uh, was definitely a non-zero uh, possibility, but the other was that this was potentially one of the greatest frauds in history. Um, so I did uh, what anyone in my position might do, and I got high. And I, and I, and I thought, um, God, I should write a book about this, you know? Um, that's how uh, all books start. That's right. Now, th this has probably happened to me many times before. I just have, you know, in the morning, you realize you probably shouldn't write that book. But I was reading my daughter, The Emperor's New Clothes. My daughter was six at the time. And I remembered the gist of the story, but I had forgotten a couple of crucial points. The, the first of which is, the tailor's trick is to say that only the smartest people, only the people of highest station, 
can perceive the imaginary clothes they weave. So adult after adult is tricked into believing the con for the simplest reason of all. They don't want to appear foolish. And the second is that at the end of the story, as the emperor is gallivanting through town naked and the adults pretend not to notice, is a child who calls out the lie. The only one brave enough to speak the truth is someone who doesn't know he's being brave. He's simply telling the truth. Well, it was hard not to put myself in the role of the child. What do I know? I'm a, I'm a former teen idol with a 20-year-old degree in economics. Um, and yet, what if I was right? And what if this was at best a speculative bubble and at worst a speculative bubble predicated on fraud? That seemed like a story I needed to tell. So I got high, I reached out to a journalist. We spent two years writing about it. It's a good summary. Good. Um, uh, you touched on a lot of themes there that I, I want to explore further, and tr particularly around narratives. I, I ducked your second question. That's all right. Okay, cool. That's okay. You can come back to it. Um, uh, when we opened up to the, the rest of us. But I want to segue quickly because I think you talked about the emperor has no clothes and kind of these, these figures that present themselves as something. And as uh, a part of your book, you really capture the rise and fall of Sam Bankman Freed and founder of FDX. You interview him in a key chapter and then you sort of capture the crash and follow it afterwards. And, you know, in DC, it's easy for industry because of it's easy for industry lobbyists uh, and some policymakers to pin the recent crypto crash on primarily on Sam Bankman Freed, uh, sort of a one bad apple uh, narrative. But the reality that we see is that the industry faces many systemic problems and there's a host of bad actors and your book really captures this. You interview Brock Pierce, you interview Alex Mashinsky and many others. And I wanna ask you before kind of opening this up, you know, aside from these folks being, you know, unofficially, officially scammers, you know, what do they have in common? Not so much about what, what about Sam Bankman Freed, but what, what do they all have in common? What motivates them? What leads others in the industry to put faith in them? And what does that tell us about the industry culture as a whole? There's an there's a obvious problem with private money, which is, you know, money is trust. We made it up, right? And so as a social construct, it relies on social consensus. If you you cannot replace that with magical bits of computer code because those bits of computer code are written by people, right? Some of, you know, all, all of us are flawed and make mistakes, but some of them, you know, um, uh, have no incentive to not steal, I guess is the way I would put it. Um, at every juncture in the cryptocurrency, I hate the word ecosystem, but in the, e the cryptocurrency industry, because it's more or less unregulated or has been underregulated, not only is there very little uh, stopping people from committing fraud, there's very little even disincentivizing them until recently from committing fraud. So at every juncture when, when value is passed from one to another, there's the propensity for fraud. And you see this with Sam Bankman fried in particular. What he's alleged to have done is to instruct one of his lieutenants to change a single number in millions of lines of computer code to create a secret backdoor where he could borrow, steal his customer's money. So I think we really need to get down to the sort of the, 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 the faulty uh, philosophy of crypto. This is a libertarian fantasy. You cannot create uh, a trustless form of money <laughs> uh, because money is trust. Saying you want to create a trustless money is like saying you want to create a governmentless government or a religionless religion. The words you're searching for are anarchy and cult. It doesn't work. And so you can throw Sam out and say, oh, he's, he's, you know, he's the lone bad apple, or well, not quite the lone bad apple, because there's, of course, Alex Mashensky, who I also interviewed, who's also indicted for fraud, and all these other guys. But the crypto industry is very, very small. And so another prediction from me, called the crypto bubble two years ago, it, during Sam's trial, watch him cast aspersions, watch him shift the blame to a few other people who have yet to go, go down in crypto. The crypto industry, for all its talk of decentralization, is heavily centralized. There's only a few players that matter. You saw this in Sam's congressional testimony that leaked before he was arrested. Um, there was a secret signal chat group uh, with CZ of Binance, the biggest exchange out there, Sam, one of the tether guys, and it was entitled Exchange Coordination. So um, just give it a beat. Don't pass any legislation, please, for anybody in this room. Please don't do any harm. Um, but let the chips fall where they may. At the end of the day, 
the, the, the faulty sort of philosophical uh, foundation of crypto is living out and playing out in real time here, and we're about to see it. Yeah. I really like how you frame that, especially because I think that fits uh, a lot with your work, Derek. I mean, we're talking about deeper than just individuals. We're talking about structural problems in the economy. We're talking about structural assumptions about how finance and economy is supposed to work. Um, and so taking your cube band, the problems of crypto go deeper than any one person uh, and are really about the assumptions that people have made about how the system is supposed to work versus how it works in reality. And Derek, I think your scholarship is focused on wealth, inequality, um, and race in America. You've talked a lot about the wealth gap, and you've pointed out how those problems are structural. They're not based on individual behaviors. Um, they're largely rooted in unfair racist policies. And yet many surveys suggest that crypto users, especially young people of color um, users, distrust legacy finance and see crypto as a quick but risky way to close that wealth gap, to leap over that chasm that has been created by years and decades of, of structural inequality. Even though some studies have shown that many um, investors who got into crypto markets might have been better off investing in traditional investments. So with that backdrop, what do you make of this? What is the long view? Is relying on this risky individualistic path to wealth the right solution? Uh, or how does this, that's, sorry, that, that's, a, that's a softball question. No, I'm done. <laughs> I made your job easy. Uh, but how does this mirror past the patterns of predatory financial behavior? What are some better public alternatives we can look to instead of these false narratives? Yeah, and I love the analogy of the emperor having no clothes and the notion of people don't want to be fools because the characterization of black people and their position in the United States is often one of they are fools. Uh, they make bad choices. They make. Uh, detrimental, they have detrimental attitudes, behaviors, norms, et cetera. Um, as a result, they're left vulnerable to not being the fool. Uh, the narrative in America is that you should seize opportunity, uh, make something of yourself. So if you have limited pathways towards traditional ways of wealth building and access to finance, uh, you are particularly vulnerable to uh, not wanting to be left behind, and what makes it pernicious, it is those individuals who really want to change their lot in life, they're the most vulnerable, especially when you have limited access to other means. So uh, that makes it particularly pernicious. And the industry, if you look at the advertisement, you look at who uh, stands for the industry, targets black people. They're, they're, I, I think that, that that's pretty vivid. So. Um, you know, two points with alternative pathways. Uh, the clear alternative pathways is more conventional forms of access to capital or literally grants of capital so that you can get into an asset that will passively appreciate over your life. That's the way we've done it in the past for uh, the vast majority of middle class wealth that has been passed down from generation to generation. It was public policy that seeded it. So the answer to me is vivid. Uh, of what we should do and coming up with specific policies to do that, uh, I don't think it's that hard. I, I think we know the solution, we know what we can do, um, and, and that, would, that would be the pathway forward. Let me say one other thing really quick, uh, vibing off what, ben, what has been describing, and that is uh, it, it is clear that crypto has failed in being uh, a value store of money in a way that actual money that the U.S. government prints provides. But if it were the case that they were successful at actually being um, a viable currency alternative, that very well may be more dangerous. Uh, that I, ultimately, um, the private sector being able to create and print money leaves society pretty vulnerable. It is during a pandemic when government has the capacity to generate and control the supply of money that prevented the great depression that allowed us to survive the pandemic it was a, a surge of, of finance into the system um, so if we limit the capacities of governments to do that that's another angle we should be concerned about and i haven't even talked about uh, the vulnerability if the private sector were able to print money and impact other aspects of our lives because of that power. 
Well noted. I, the, we're going to talk a little bit more about so what I call techno-solutionism in a minute there, which is sort of assuming that tech, technology can solve problems of governance and democratic governance. I also really like your point around the contrast between sort of the more flashy public-facing aspects of crypto as a solution versus sort of tried and true public and collective solutions that you know may not have a marketing campaign behind them, but are the things we know that work. And I think that's part of our narrative challenge is finding ways to to make sure that those alternatives are more visible and more engaging for a wider set of people because in the world we live in, we're gonna be attracted by sort of the bright shiny object and miss the opportunity to build more lasting um, prosperity for people. Yeah. And, and that coupled with a narrative of uh, make something of your life, that's the other part. Yeah. It's a pernicious, it's casino capitalism, right? I mean, that's why I you know, included that in the subtitle. It's, it's, it's a, it preys upon people's weaknesses and their, and their vulnerability. It's, 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 and, and the affinity fraud is such a good point. I mean, whether it was you know, Spike Lee's commercials for ATMs in the black community, uh, women in NFTs, Reese Witherspoon selling that nonsense. I mean, what it does is it sort of plays on a psychology, right? Right, where you're sort of, oh, I, I know this person, I trust this person, Jay-Z and Jack Dorsey setting up Bitcoin Academy in Marcy Gardens. Um, you know, in the, in the weeks after they announced that project, the price of Bitcoin dropped 30%. So I guess one of the lessons of Bitcoin Academy is that this stuff ain't money and it can, it can drop 30% in a couple of weeks. Um, this is incredibly pernicious and when when the when the bubble's expanding when 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 at least on screen people see their money growing they become de facto evangelists for un, unwittingly for this false narrative right they say hey man you got to get into this because i you know made money at least this is that's what my phone tells me right but that's just an mlm that's just a multi-level marketing scheme at the end of the day these quote unquote digital assets are not actually correlated with anything of value in the real world so we have to fight the false narrative with the true narrative. And I, I, I apologize for going on a rant, but, but these, these, we have to call it out. The, this, that's affinity fraud. That's exactly what that is. And I think it takes different forms, forms in different places. And you know, I was going to ask both you and also Tenanson that there's a chapters in your book that deal with El Salvador, where the government has adopted Bitcoin as a currency by Bukele with, um, let's say, mixed results. Um, you also spent some time at the Miami Bitcoin conference, and that intersects a lot of the sort of um, city-level enthusiasm for crypto as a way to generate public financing, um, oddly enough. And Tenanzin, this really parallels some of your work. Um, you know, you've heard, heard Ben and Derek speak, you've thought about the content of the book. I'm just curious, what parallels do you see between that phenomenon and the things that you've, ex you've explored and you've named as problems? Um, what's the difference between what crypto is selling and what those cities and, and places are actually buying? Uh, everything? I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm just... <laughs> Um, well, I actually appreciate both of your, your points and your work uh, for two very different reasons, but also so interconnected. Um, I actually started studying cryptocurrencies because I was looking at issues of Latino wealth. So I was super you know, interested in Derek Hamilton's work. I'm like, baby bonds, like, let's go. And um, all of a sudden, I have you know, some reporters talk about, well, um, we see this trend of black and Latino individuals, you know, going into crypto for wealth building opportunities. Um, they, they believe that this is going to help them build wealth. And I didn't really understand crypto. I went into a rabbit hole. I think we've talked about this at some point. We watched the, like the blockchain videos of like um, open courseware for MIT, uh, Gary Gensler's courses. And I, and I started studying and examining it and alarm bells just started ringing. Um, and then at the same time of watching what was happening in communities of color, I start to see, well, there are mayors now that are actively talking about how great crypto is. And you, know, you had Miami, you had New York, we had in a, a certain periods, like Chicago, we had others. And then you had Bukele in, in El Salvador. And so on the one hand, you know, you have communities of color going into this space. Later when the market crashes then, you know, Presumably, then you blame them for going into this space, but you actually had people in authority positions that were saying, this is great, this is the future. They were specifically making the financial inclusion claims. And so it was, it's actually just interesting to think about it from like both lanes. So on the one hand, I'm very grateful that I had actually approached this, one from a curiosity perspective, but also having understood very clearly that 
public policies over time helped create this, the massive inequities that we see now. So it's gonna take public policies as solutions and yet here we have tech being explored and this is the, the thing that solves issues for the unbanked. It also solves issues for remittances. It also solves issues for um, generating wealth and it's all under this financial inclusion umbrella but when you start to dig deep, you start to see that mismatch between you know, the, what the technology is purported to do and the needs of the populations that it's gonna serve. Like for the unbanked, for example, like in a lot of cases you actually need a bank account to start to use some of the exchanges. <laughs> um, or you use things like Bitcoin ATMs, which have so many hidden fees and like have anything from seven to 21% per transaction. So it's, you know, have, have all of these high costs. From a wealth generating perspective, like if anything, it's just this idea that it's only going to be valuable if other people believe it's valuable. And so it, it, like it doesn't make sense because you could be left holding the bag as soon as people decide it's no longer valuable, which is what happened and a lot of communities got harmed. Um, so it's kind of like this mix of, I understand why certain communities went into this space. I don't view them as fools. I don't, like to me it was actually really rational in that if you do not have access to traditional avenues for accessing basic financial services or building wealth, it is, makes so much sense that you're gonna seek out alternatives. But that doesn't mean that those alternatives are always safer. And so just the last point that I always talk about is this idea of predatory inclusion that kept popping up. So like you're, you're talking about affinity fraud. Um, that term is like one that I've connected. I've seen a lot of other folks and scholars connected to cryptocurrencies, but I actually learned it from scholars like Kianga Yamada Taylor, uh, Louis Seamster, Tressie McMillan Cotton, Rafael Char uh, Charon Chenier. When they talked about this idea of, uh, or they talked about the concept tied to things like subprime loans, uh, for-profit colleges, um, payday loans, and the idea is that when a community lacks access or they are traditionally excluded from accessing a specific product, service, or opportunity, all of a sudden they're told, you're gonna get access. But that access comes with conditions that undermine the benefits. So with subprime loans, we saw people, you know, get access to wealth building and to home ownership, but that came at a cost, high risks, um, high, you know, high cost, high, high risk, high cost. Similarly with crypto, it's like we were selling them, well, this is gonna provide you access to this thing but at what cost, with what risks? Um, and so, I mean, trying to tie both of your thoughts, but that's at least where my well, that, mind headed. When you were that's a great that. point. And one of the sort of many ironies of crypto is that of course it was birthed in the wake of the subprime crisis, yes. right? The Bitcoin white paper came out in October of 2008 at the height of the crisis. And so the, the story that you could create this peer to peer currency and avoid all intermediaries, read banks, is very appealing, right? Um, but just, just because crypto does this all the time, they say, you hate the banks? Crypto you know, solves that. You, you wanna you know, uh, build generational wealth? Crypto will do that. It, it becomes this catch-all. And as long as you can kind of vaguely talk about innovation and inclusion and generational wealth building and never really get down to the actual numbers, um, this story has incredible power because we have screwed over people for, you know, for a very long time, but everyone is aware of it because of the subprime crisis. Derek, I see you nodding your head. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think we're, we're honing in that uh, the public sector has left, left us vulnerable to crypto. And that that's if we're talking about structural issues and we're thinking about uh, solutions. At the end of the day, if it's not crypto, it'll be somebody else. It, it's a prevalent structure as a result of not having pathways for people that leave them vulnerable, along with a broader narrative, again, that we're all emphasizing, which is uh, be responsible, pick yourself up by the bootstrap. So it's not that black people are fools, it's the fear of being labeled a fool that, that leaves them particularly vulnerable. And then one, one other point, you know, just in the international space, uh, the United States government, the dollar is the hegemonic currency. I know there's a lot of talk about BRICS currency and other, but at this point in time, uh, and I think for at least a considerable uh, long time in the future, uh, it is the hegemonic currency. And with that, there's responsibility. So as other nations in the global South deal with their currency crisis as well as debt crises, 
the U.S. government has a fiduciary not just to its citizens but to the world to try to provide stabilization and not leave El Salvador vulnerable to trying to find alternatives like cryptocurrency. I find in D.C., when I try to explain what it's like to talk about crypto in the context of all these other things to different stakeholders who are bringing different pieces of the puzzle to, to the placement, as it were, financial regulation and finance is already complicated, even for, for folks who are versed in it. Um, digital technology and tech is complicated and tech policy is complicated. When you bring the two of those things together, the Venn diagram of people who can navigate that space is, is relatively small, small and that kind of asymmetry plays to those who are either you know, with good intentions trying to create something without considering the consequences or with bad intentions are trying to exploit that. And I think that speaks to this broader issue of we have solutions, democracy is messy but it can work. We want to believe that tech can save us but often it you know, introduces a whole new set of problems. And so we're kind of back to a place where we have to get back to first principles and figure out what, are we, what problems are we really trying to solve and, and how can we solve them. And, and we, ha we really have to talk about, you know, blockchain is not new. It is 30 years old, over, over 30 years old. It goes back to at least 1991. Stuart Haber and Scott W. Stornetta at Bell Labs building off of the work of cryptographers such as David Chom. Blockchain is just a ledger. It's an append-only ledger. It is not revolutionary. It may find a use case at some point. I was talking with some folks about, uh, uh, you know, closing it's just, you know, it's sort of the plumbing of our of our uh, federal uh, uh, reserve system. But up to this point, the only two use cases for this 30-plus-year-old technology are gambling, which is trading crypto, and crime. That's it. Gambling zero sum at best, right? Crime, <laughs> I think is a bad thing. I mean, that would that, call me crazy, but that, I'm, I'm anti-crime uh, in general, you know? Uh, and, and, and so, you know, we have to uh, really dispel this notion that even the technology is an innovative technology. When you talk to cryptographers, some of the people that are most dismissive of blockchain are computer scientists and cryptographers, right? Well, the ones that don't work in the crypto industry. Funny how that works. And I have to just say to that point, like one of the things I found most frustrating when like looking into this space was that just the way that we, when you even talked about this in the beginning, like the, the, the use of language, to me it was just so manipulative throughout. But specifically what came to mind right now is the way that we would conflate present capabilities versus potential. So it would be like, it can do this or it's going to like bolster financial inclusion even though presently it does not but that's not how it was talked about it was always like it does it presently even though the present capabilities of crypto did not match up that's right and they call it still early that's yes, that's the, the phrase they use it and was always i'm like 15 years later that's right it's still early. and 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 you know who kept saying that over to me over and sam bankman free sam bankman free when i interviewed him in july of last year was telling me you know i said give me one use case give me one company that's doing anything and he went around, he, he talked about remittances actually. And I had just come from El Salvador where they were saying remittances were the reason that Bukele was instituting this other currency. You know, because El Salvador's economy is heavily reliant on remittances. A quarter of the economy is the two to three million people of Salvadoran descent that live here sending money home. So if crypto could work as a form of remittances, as a sort of a, a rough store of value, and you could avoid the fees that traditional services like MoneyGram, Western Union charge. That could be a win-win. Boost government coffers, reduce fees for, for the, the people of El Salvador. But I just went there. It's not working. Less than 1% of remittances are using the Chivo wallet system the government created. Why? Because it doesn't work. Because it fails all the time. Because there's a lot of fraud. <laughs> this is the same problems that, that plague crypto more broadly. So when Sam said, it's remittance, as I said, bullshit. And then we went around and around again, and he came back to, I said, you know, there's one company. He came back to Solana, which is a coin you don't need to know about, except that he owns a lot of it. So, you know, give me a break. Important data point. The, 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 one, of the, one of the things, the easy money is about crypto. It's really about money and lying. One of the things a fraudster will do is tell you, no, 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 just, just trust me, trust me, trust me. It's not there yet, but it will. It will. Just hold on. Give me a little bit more money. And let me come back to you in a minute. And they, you know, they're just doing that on a massive scale. Unfortunately, you know, it, too late we're realizing what they were doing. I think for me, and I'd be curious to hear what all of you think about this. I, 
one of the arguments we have here in policy circles is um, the, the technology is not there yet, but that's not the fault of the technologists. That's the fault of regulators. That's the fault of others for, for not creating an environment that will allow the new tech to thrive. And you know, I, I know what we say, and I'll, I'll you know, say one sentence because I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but uh, which is basically uh, there's rarely no, anything new under the sun. And what we should be doing with regulation of financial actors and, act and activities is to really apply the same principles across the board and be robust and consumer oriented. We shouldn't be doing carve outs for special, um, for special interests. Have you all seen that elsewhere where we can take lessons um, from the past? Because I think we have, but I'm curious to know what you think. Even we, we'd say that without crypto, right? That, that happens in other places. Um, what warning should we be taking from the past to make sure the future doesn't put us in the same situation? I mean, innovation has always been used by fraudsters yeah. to deceive. I mean, Charles Ponzi, um, international reply coupons. That was a real thing, you know, and you could arbitrage the difference between, you know, the price of the coupons in Europe and, and, and the United States. Um, but he wasn't doing it. <laughs> and the scheme got so big that eventually, a report, actually very quickly, within a year, a reporter figured out that his scheme was larger than the entire market for international reply coupons. Yeah. So fraudsters use innovation because who's anti-innovation? But you have to separate what's actually innovative from, you know, bullshit. Yeah. Derek. Right, so the broader question about technology in general, there, there are some things that are unprecedented going on now. And that is the speed and absorption of technology, I, I think. Uh, uh, but we would be naive not to look at points in history in which we've had transformative technology. So uh, the Industrial Revolution, the cotton gin, which was extremely oppressive to black people. I think that in the lessons from the past, the ways in which we absorb technology with consideration of three factors, uh, politics, economics, and identity group stratification. So the, the politics have to do with the ways in which it's regulated, the ways in which rules and structures are defined. Uh, the economics have to do with who controls resources that can uh, affect transaction markets, that can, that can divert power in strategic ways. And identity group stratification has to do with deservedness who is not seen as a full citizen, and all three iteratively relate to each other, race, politics, and economics. And I think the lessons of the past, look at the cotton gin. Look at how that amplified the slave trade, but yet led to high growth across not just the United States, but other parts of Europe with trade as well. And that was completely innovative of the time. We went from agrarian towards manufacturing, and I'm just using that as an example. There were other things, and I'm simplifying it. So with AI right now, with whatever it is, Bitcoin, we are making a big, big mistake if we're not considering those three elements with any framework of any technology, period. It's really powerful. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry, you have to follow that. <laughs> no. Well, I was just thinking too. I mean, like in listening to you, I, I think if we think that tech is always just positive, it's just so ahistorical, or it's not even thinking about the impact of communities of color, marginalized communities in general. Like the assumption is always positive, but it, you can always point to examples where things like facial recognition can be really dangerous, um, or surveillance, or issues on privacy, and so. Uh, I think that the, like maybe looking to the past, we can understand you know how to like maybe regulate or address the present. But I also think there's so many new tech issues and emerging tech issues that are happening now that we can actually look at crypto. And I hope that that experience informs how we now approach future emerging technologies because this isn't going to be the last thing. There's just going to be now new iterations yeah. like, happening over and over. And, and, and as to the, like, you know, so, so crypto really wants to give you FOMO, right? That's really one of its best marketing strategies was to give you fear of missing out. Um, we used to call it greed. Now we call it fear of missing out. They, they, they want you to feel like you're missing out. Like, you, you, like if we don't do this right now, if you don't invest very quickly, you're going to lose it. If we don't hold on to this amazing technology, it's 30 years old, but let's 
leave that aside for a second, then we will lose it. And, I, and, and one question is, okay, so, so where is the innovation spreading to? Hong Kong, UAE, and Singapore. Do you notice any similarities between these countries in terms of like the, the way that the governance works, right? I mean, we, we have a terrible history of this. Private money is deeply associated with fraud. The free banking era, 1837 to 1863, when banks were allowed to issue their own notes, it was also called the wildcat banking era because you could set up your bank as far away from your depositors as you like, and then once you had their money, what was stopping you from running away with it? So private money is just, it's just, it's just rife with, with opportunities for fraud. And, and you know, I'm gonna double down and say, if we look at cryptocurrency with that three pillar lens, there'll be lessons learned. Think about the economics, politics, and who is considered deserved and undeserved, the race, gender, identity group stratification aspects of it. Consider all three of those elements when we analyze crypto, we'll see similarities of the past and we'll understand how to deal with the next thing that comes along. And then the other thing I'll just point out is that, you know, we're, we're giving a dismal outlook as to what crypto has done in its capacity uh, to generate social good. But technology in general, we also need to be careful not to be dismissive and, and so fearful. You know, the, the narratives about jobs are gonna uh, be lost. Some will, and we need to manage that uh, with clarity, concern, and all the, the social uh, benefits that we do, any, any, any phenomena. But that shouldn't inhibit us from thinking about the positive things and the ways in which we can think about economics, yeah. politics, and inclusion in positive ways that we absorb new technology. I, I really like what you said there because it's reminded me that one thing, you know, if I've thought about it, like what, what positives have come from this conversation, and I do think that um, in some strange, uh, sometimes painful and also wonderful ways, it's allowed us to revisit why do we have certain institutions in the first place? Why, why, do, why does the government play the role in money creation that it does? How can it be made better? You, you've seen with the collapse of SVB for the first time there's a conversation around banking as a public utility. I shouldn't say first time. A new conversation about banking as a public utility, um, which is revisiting old assumptions about what banks are for. Um, and I think to a certain degree, um, these uh, the way in which the crypto industry has sort of jumped into the fray and crypto enthusiasts have said, oh, we can work every, uh, we can remix Replace everything government. and all turn around. And it's like, no, we can't do that, but we should be asking these questions. Yeah. If there's one good thing that crypto does, it's point out the myriad flaws in our regulated financial system. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, too, I, there's also an opportunity to create a more affirmative vision for tech. And how do you do that? Like, it seemed like we always started with the tech to solve all of these issues versus why don't we start with what is the type of society that we want to see, a more just, racially equitable society, and then build tech on top of those ideals, those principles. But it was always like tech was going to solve this, like so retrofitting. It was really odd. But if we start with what we want, what is the vision for society, like that's where we can start to create a more affirmative vision. And almost any technology has, you know, it's malleable. Like you, you can go a certain direction because, of course, human beings are <laughs> responsible yes. for, for creating that technology. We have to separate the technology from the rent sinking. The rent sinking is really, I think, one of the things that we're so, you know, that I'm so fired up about. You see that in AI, you know, like the, the purse guys in are trying to basically, you know, wall it off. And some of those people, the VCs are the people who finance the crypto boom. What a surprise. A what a surprise. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. World coin where they scan your irises. Yeah. It's horrible. World, World coin <laughs> is a, it's straight out of a dystopian science fiction novel. Yeah. A bad one. Yeah. We are, we're coming up on time, and I feel like we've just scratched the surface here, but I, I've really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope we can continue it. Um, I just want to ask if any of you have any quick closing thoughts about what folks here should take away from what we've talked about today, or anything you're interested or ex, you know, excited about doing more in this space, whether it's financial, uh, public alternatives, financial inclusion. Sure. I mean, I, I'm most certainly bashing the crypto industry yeah i think interested in okay if you know folks do not see traditional avenues for building wealth accessing financial services then that's what we need to build out otherwise they're going to continue to seek alternatives whatever form that takes and so for me at least it's clarified like a lot of the issues that we have specifically um you know, the status quo isn't working. That doesn't mean crypto is the alternative. And so we need to find things that can actually work for communities that have been historically excluded. 
Well, first, uh, my uh, panelists and the moderator, I just felt my head shaking my head, yes. <laughs> so uh, it, it is an honor and pleasure to be up here with y'all, and y'all have said some brilliant Likewise. things. Uh, in terms of takeaways, you know, I go back to government has a big responsibility uh, that, that the structural part is government, and it is our government. So we get to create structures that are, um, as was described, forward-looking in ways to promote the values that we want by way of the public sector. Uh, that part of the reason, and then the iteration of uh, politics, economics, and race also needs to be thought of. Part of the reason that cryptocurrency may be unregulated is if, if certain populations start to get more vulnerable, I suspect there'd be more public action to redress it. So, Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank is a great example, right? So again, I, I think we need to consider the framework of what is it about when government does act and when it doesn't act, uh, who has the economic power uh, to manipulate rules and structures, and what is the face of the, the, the presumed uh, group that's suffering? And once we crack that nut, we'll be able to address not only crypto, but many things that are gonna come our way. Yeah, I just wanna build off of uh, what Derek was saying. There is a real opportunity here. You know, uh, you, if the public sector is the only solution for these problems, which we argue it is, it has to be, there is no alternative. There's only one party that believes in government, really, right? And that it could work. So that's, with great power comes great responsibility. We have a responsibility to show that, to demonstrate it. And I will say, just you know, alongside that, um, corruption, anti-corruption polls really well. <laughs> it's a very good thing to, uh, as, a, as, a, as a way of winning elections, as a way of, say, juxtaposing yourself with, say, the con man who was elected as president, you know, um, we should. But the thing is, that party then needs to live it. That party then needs to actually uh, <laughs> cleanse itself at times. And so I think there's a real opportunity here. It's not easy. But um, moving forward, I, th I, I think that um, it's an opportunity, especially for a younger generation to, to really to live that. I, I a lot of all of that I take to heart and I think is, is a good statement on, on where we've come today. I think the thing I want to say is, you know, a lot of the folks in this room uh, are part of those conversations about how to address this, what to do about it. There are a lot of policy conversations. People are talking about how to address um, different parts of the financial system, how to regulate it, whether to regulate it. And, you know, um, we have always tried to intone with policymakers that um, those who are fighting the good fight that it's better to get this um, right than to do it quickly. That's not always a popular thing to say here, simply because politics is the art of the possibility. Um, but we need to say it because the things we're talking about tonight are profound, they're structural, um, there's long-term implications. And rather than look at that as a challenge um, that has to be simply muddled through or with, we can look at it as an opportunity to really set the stage for a, for a new approach that takes into account the values and the, and the goals and the aspirations we've talked about here today. So I think with that, we'll close. I just wanted to say thank you again to our speakers, Ben, Derek, and Anson. It's been a real pleasure um, and honor. Thank you for making the time. I know uh, you all carved time out of your busy schedule to meet with us here tonight. Thank all of you for coming. I hope you enjoyed what you heard. I hope we can continue these conversations afterwards. Um, thanks to our uh, hosts, Best Boys and Poets. It's been great uh, here having this event here tonight. And um, please join us in uh, continuing to ask questions about this strange, weird um, crypto space and all the things we need to do to address it. Um, please stay. We have uh, more refreshments, and thanks again. Thank you.